This would have been summer 1986. It was the week before I started first grade. Mom had already got me all of the school supplies I would need for the coming year, except for one thing, a backpack. I'd seen the one I wanted at Kmart a few weeks before, so Mom went out to get it while I spent the day with my grandparents. She picked me up and brought me home that afternoon, and as she was leading me through the house to my bedroom, she said, now, I do have some bad news. They were all sold out of the backpack you wanted, but the one I got for you is just as good. I walked into my bedroom. There on my bed was a Batman backpack. And I started to cry. I threw a tantrum, actually. What can I say? I had my heart set on a Superman backpack. And I was a spoiled brat. I refused to carry the Batman backpack. Mom had to return it and go back out before school started and get the Superman one that I asked for, which she managed to track down somewhere. This was long before online shopping was even a thing. So there were a lot more actual stores that you could go to to look for stuff. And she found it in one of them in Zares or Nichols or Sears or some other place that doesn't exist anymore. Looking back, there's a lot about that story I find funny and embarrassing. There's what an entitled little shit I was, of course. And there's also the fact that while my love for Superman would never fade and would, in fact, only grow stronger as the years went by, in a few years, Batman, whose image on my first grade backpack had sent me into a petulant fit, would be my favorite character by far and would help to shape me into the person I would grow up to be. So blame Batman is what I'm saying. <laughs> it's all his fault. When Tim Burton's Batman starring Michael Keaton in the title role and Jack Nicholson as the Joker opened in 1989, I just turned nine years old. Before that, I knew Batman primarily from the various versions of the Super Friends cartoon that had aired on Saturday mornings for as long as I could remember. I was way more interested in Superman, who I knew not only from Super Friends, but from the films starring Christopher Reeve, and a VHS tape containing several of the Fleischer Brothers animated shorts that my grandparents had given me. But come summer 1989, Batman was everywhere. Mom took me to see the movie and I loved it. It was the most thrilling thing I'd ever seen. That year for my birthday, my dad had gotten me my first computer, a Commodore 64. One of the first games I got for it was called Batman the Caped Crusader. It consisted of two sections, one with the penguin as the villain, the other with the Joker, and was presented in a style that mimicked comic books with new locations enclosed in panels on the screen. I don't think I ever actually beat the game, but for months I spent almost every free hour I had on it. That summer, several of our local TV stations began airing reruns of the Adam West Batman show weekday afternoons. They couldn't have been more different from the version of Batman I'd seen on the big screen, but I was starving for anything Batman related, so I never missed an episode. It was also during the Batmania of 1989 that I finally got around to reading Batman comic books. Go figure. I discovered, unbeknownst to me, that I was actually in the middle of something of a Batman comics renaissance. The Dark Knight Returns came out in 1986, Batman Year One the year after that, and both The Killing Joke and A Death in the Family, the storyline that resulted in the death of the second Robin the year after that. Eventually, I got around to reading all of them, but the first Batman comic I ever read was a reprint of a miniseries from 1980 called The Untold Legend of the Batman. And these aren't the actual comics that I read back then. I got these on eBay just a few weeks ago, actually. The ones I had back in 89 were printed in a slightly smaller format than is standard for a monthly comic, and they were packaged with cassettes that contained full audio versions of the story of each issue with a full voice cast, music, sound effects, the whole works. I don't have those anymore, sadly, but the audio versions have been uploaded to YouTube, so you can check them out if you're interested. I listened to them again just recently for the first time in a long time, and they're a lot cornier than they seemed to me when I was nine. 
go figure. Still, they had a big impact on me as a kid. I listened to those tapes over and over over and over again for years, even after the raspy growl that was introduced by Michael Keaton and refined by Kevin Conroy became the standard, Batman's voice from Untold Legend was still how I thought he should sound. If you've never read it or listened to it, The Untold Legend of the Batman is sort of like the comic book equivalent of a clip show. The artwork is all original, and by John Byrne and Jim Aparo, no less, so it's pretty good. The credited writer is Len Wein, and there is a thin thread of an original story running through it, but that story isn't much more than a conceit. Most of the series consists of retellings of important episodes from Batman's life, almost all of which had been presented in earlier comics, some as far back as the 1940s. There's the murder of Thomas and Martha Wayne, of course, as well as the murder of Dick Grayson's parents and the origin of Robin. We also see origins for the Joker and Two-Face, the relationship between Batman and Commissioner Gordon, even the Batmobile. There's also a lot of stuff that is no longer considered a part of the character's official canon by DC Comics, like Batman finding the man who killed his parents, then finding the man who hired the man who killed his parents, and the depiction of how Alfred came to find himself in the service of Bruce Wayne is totally different from the current official version. The fact that so much of this series is no longer canon doesn't bother me as I page through it today, and it certainly wasn't important to me in 1989. What was important was that for the first time I was starting to learn about who Batman was. He was becoming more than an action figure. He was becoming a person with friends and family and a history. I started to feel like I knew him. He had a specific personality, a way of being in the world that was unique to him, and I was beginning to recognize and understand this. This is all basic, obvious stuff to me now, but when I was nine, I was just starting to figure out that you can relate to fictional characters in a way that is similar to how we relate to real people. A moment ago, I said that Batman was becoming more than an action figure to me. Well. I had those too, <laughs> believe me. They weren't nearly as nice as this one. Smaller, not as well sculpted, but what did I care? I started using my action figures to act out the stories that I read in my comic books or saw on TV. I had to do all the voices myself, and my bed or my desk or my bedroom floor served as locations with my imagination filling in the rest. Eventually, I started making up my own stories, imagining new adventures for Batman and Robin. Despite the movies presenting him as a solo act, I soon came to feel that it was wrong for the caped crusader to be without the boy wonder. In 1992, three big Batman-related things happened. First, that summer, Batman Returns, the second Michael Keaton, Tim Burton Batman film, opened in theaters. And then that fall, Batman the Animated Series premiered on TV, and I entered the seventh grade. My English teacher that year was Mrs. Daniels. The first day of class, she told us that things would be a lot different this year than we were used to. Instead of focusing on grammar and reading, the class would be centered on writing. Sometimes we'd be prompted what to write, but most of the time we would have the freedom to choose. Our grade would be based on our writing, and we could write whatever we wanted. So I started writing Batman stories. I'd been reading Batman comics for the last few years, mostly reprints of stuff from the 50s and 60s and 70s that had been published to tie in with the movies, but some other recent stuff too. And there was a new movie and the new cartoon series, which I noticed drew a lot of inspiration from the comics, especially the ones from the 70s. So I was overflowing with ideas for Batman stories. Back then, I didn't know the term fan fiction. My first story for English class was titled Batman, The Case of the Deadly Riddles. It was my attempt at presenting the epic first encounter between Batman and the Riddler as I imagined it might go if they decided to bring the Riddler to the big screen just as they'd done with the Joker, the Penguin, and Catwoman. This was still a few years before Batman Forever, remember. I wrote it out in pencil on loose leaf notebook paper. It was four pages long. But Mrs. Daniels liked it. 
or at least she liked it well enough to permit me to continue writing Batman stories for her class, as long as I took a break every now and then and wrote about other things, which I did. I wrote about lots of things that year, but my heart was always with my Batman stories. And through them, I discovered that I loved to write. Eventually, I moved on to writing other stuff, and writing Batman stories became more of a hobby. But it was a hobby I stuck with until I was a few years out of high school. I even started a website and began publishing my own Batman fanfic series. It branched off from the comic books at the time, which had just finished a storyline where Bruce Wayne resumed being Batman after Dick Grayson had filled in for him for a few months. And this was also not too long after the conclusion of the lengthy Nightfall story arc where Bruce Wayne had left Gotham City after having his back broken only to be replaced by his increasingly unstable successor Jean-Paul Valley, who had previously been an assassin who was brainwashed by a sinister religious order. A lot of stuff happened to Batman in the 90s. Around this same time, I also began posting on the message board of a website called The Dark Knight. The site also had a chat room where I made some friends that I still have to this day. In fact, I met my friend Christopher, who hosts the monthly Pierre the Chef live stream with me in the Dark Knight's chat room, which was called the Gotham Gossip, or as we casually referred to it, the Goss, because fully pronouncing words is for suckers. The Goss is also where I met my first serious long-term girlfriend. So if any of you ever asked me for dating or relationship advice on a You Had to Ask video and the advice I gave you turned out to be terrible, now you know why. My first serious relationship was with someone I met in a Batman chat room. We went out for about two years. It was mostly really good. We're still friends, even though we haven't actually seen each other since the breakup. We still talk occasionally, once or twice a year. And though we have both moved on and we are now happily with other people, it's impossible for me to imagine my life turning out the way it has without that relationship. And I never would have had that relationship without Batman. When Batman and Robin came out in 1997, it was so bad that I actually wrote my own Batman movie. It was the first screenplay I ever wrote, and to do it, I learned proper screenplay format. For years after that, I wrote screenplays, read screenplays, took screenwriting classes in college, studied film and theater. That led to me working for a few years with Neon Real Entertainment, where I got some experience on movie sets, both in front of and behind the camera, helping to make films that were screened at regional festivals, which was pretty cool. And once again, I made some really great friends. Obviously, my YouTube videos are about as far from cinematic as you can get, but I'd like to think that my experiences, modest though they've been, as a screenwriter and actor and member of a low-budget film crew, inform the work that I do here and make it better than it otherwise would be. There's no question those experiences inform the way I think about film, which benefits not only the movie review videos I occasionally produce for this channel, but also Late Seating, the movie review podcast I co-host. Cheap plug for Late Seating. Listen to it. It's awesome. I know I talk a lot about Star Trek on this channel, and Star Trek is one of my favorite things in the world, but before I loved it, I loved Batman. And loving Batman... Those characters, those stories, that world, and all the many forms they took helped to shape my life. This is why fandom has such a powerful hold on so many of us. Whatever it is we're fans of, comic book characters, TV shows, film franchises, book series, sports teams, it compels us to go down roads we would never have taken otherwise. It draws us into communities we would never have been a part of. It brings us together with people we never would have met. It encourages us to learn skills and explore other areas of interest that we never would have pursued. It's not just Batman. It's all the experiences I've had and all the people I've met and all the things I've learned about myself because of Batman. And maybe for you, it's not Batman. Maybe for you, it's Star Wars or Firefly or Harry Potter or the Yankees or the Red Sox or God help you, the Orioles. Woohoo, fifth place. Whatever it is, I'm willing to bet that almost all of you watching this right now have something 
something you read, something you watch, something you collect, something that you never tire of talking about, something that you share with other people who love it. And when you meet a new person who loves it the same way that you love it, you feel that instant spark of connection, something that you come back to again and again. I've accumulated several such somethings over the years, Star Trek, Superman, the films of Stanley Kubrick and Buster Keaton, pro wrestling. But the first one to really grab me and not let go was Batman. And everything I have and everything I am, I owe, at least in some small measure, to him. So thanks, Batman. No problem. He said, you're welcome. Am I the only one who heard that?